from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Mihal, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosabianca. What's on tap today, Lou? Matt, do you realize from the morning we wake up to when we go to bed, we're always selling? I mean, we're selling our spouses, we're selling our team, we're selling clients. We're always selling. It doesn't stop, right? There is, according to Mr. Craig Andrews, our next podcast guest, an unspoken language of sales. So to enlighten us, Craig, welcome to the podcast. And what is the unspoken language of sales? Hey, Matt and Lou, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Um, the unspoken language of sales is the language that our body emits. It's our body language that when you have an in internal desire to close, it just comes out in the way you talk, in the way you move. And unless you're a bona fide sociopath, you can't hide it. It just comes out. And we see that as the enemy of sales because you know what? People don't like being sold when they realize you're trying to sell them. What do they do? They put their guard up. Whoa, whoa, hey, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you can call them up, say, hey, I have a free brick of gold for you. And next question they're going to ask is, what are you selling? So how do you leverage that into creating a very friendly sales platform. And I mean, look, obviously we all have different sales pitchers, right? Matt likes to say, I'm a little bit of an academic, so I kind of try to educate. And by educating, I think, hey, our products sell themselves. Matt is a little bit more analytical and diabolical in his sales approach. I mean, he's a born salesman, right? So we all come, come at it from a different angle. Walk us through how you see the world of sales. Well, yeah, and let me start by saying I'm a horrible salesperson. Um, and I mean, I just am. And what I, um, and when the family started starving a little bit uh, too much, I was like, something has to change. And so what hit me was I need to change the, um, instead of trying to sell, I need to create an environment where people want to buy. And so we started doing something called first time offers. And we can go into all the details, but the key thing, uh, that makes one of the things, there's a lot of things that make these work, but one of the things that makes this work is you take yourself out of sales mode. You know, it's just this irresistible offer that if you put it in front of a qualified buyer, they're going to say yes. So you don't have to sell. The second thing is we use it as a filter to try to filter out people that have certain traits and we design the offers uh, to create that filter. And so from that angle, you don't want to try to sell it to somebody that's designed to repel. You just want to let it do its work and just sit back and you know, be more, you know, like you were saying, Lou, just uh, give them the information, let them know, let the offer do the selling. And what I found is, at least for me, when I do that, it changes my body language, the the things that I can't control, and, and, um, and the results are, are pretty amazing. Hey, so Greg, kind of walk us through what a good first time offer is. You know, sometimes with these internet companies and, and SaaSes, you always see these promotions, but the promotions made to be sticky, right? So they get you in and then it's like a mousetrap and you can't get out. Um, versus, do you remember in the years ago, banks used to offer like toasters or bicycles? You open up a bank account and you get a new gift. I think my grandmother used to open a bank account at every bank on the corner and she'd come, come home with blenders and toasters and all sorts of gadgets. Um, what is a wholesome first time offer that will lead to recurring revenue? Yeah. You know, it really depends upon, uh, the segment of the market you're selling to. And so I, you know, I think I mentioned in the green room, I'm, you know, I'm working on a book right now in this. And one of the examples I bring out in that is the, uh, you remember the sports illustrated, uh, football phone. They, uh, they sold 1.6 million subscriptions to sports illustrated. Uh, by offering, you know, you subscribe and we'll ship you this tacky little phone. And uh, 
And it worked. And to this day, if you go on eBay, that phone is 40 bucks. If you can find somebody and give up that phone, it's 40 bucks. It's become a classic. It has. And if you're selling magazine subscriptions, that works great. Uh, I I work exclusively with folks that do high ticket uh, products or sales. Usually it's B2B uh, services, professional services, consultants, agencies, uh, folks like that. Uh, but we've also done like financial advisors. And there's two things that change the game and football phone didn't go and cut it. Uh, one, it's high ticket. You know, you're not selling a cheap magazine subscription. And two, it's usually high trust. You know, so we have somebody we're working with right now. Their core offers $1.2 million. Well, <laughs> you can offer all the football phones you want. It's not going it's not enticing enough to move them across. So here's, let me give you an example of what we would call a complex offer. This, is, this isn't one we design, but I love it. It's a great example because everybody can relate to it. Uh, years ago, there was a guy um, named Bob Stupak who bought a dumpy old hotel at the end of the Vegas Strip. And he decided he was going to make it a player on the Strip. Uh, you now know it as the Strat. It used to be the Stratosphere. And Bob Stupak, but when Bob Stupak bought it, it was a dump and he called it Bob Stupak's Vegas World. And he ran an offer. He said, give me $396 and I will give you three days and two nights in one of my deluxe suites. When you arrive, there will be a bottle of champagne waiting for you in your room. All of your drinks on property are free, whether you're gambling or not. Even if you're sitting in one of our entertainment venues, you pay nothing more for your drinks. And not only that, but for your $396, I'm going to give you $600 of chips to use in my casino. So right there, we have what we would call a complex offer. Instead of you know, a simple deliverable football phone for subscription, we now have four deliverables. We believe they should have like minimum of three, maximum of five. Um, Bob Stupak's offer has four deliverables. And if you're the type of person that likes to drink and gamble, that's a hard offer to say no to. I don't gamble. Uh, and, you know, if I drink, it's it's going to be a nice wine. I don't think that's what they were offering. And so for me, that's it's not a good offer. But this is really, really good for Bob Stupak because he had designed an offer that attracted his ideal clients, ideal customers, and repelled the non-ideal. You know, he only had so many room, rooms in that in that hotel. And he would make the most money if everybody, every room was filled with somebody who likes to drink and gamble. He was going to make a ton of money. So he didn't want me staying in his uh, hotel. He wanted somebody who wanted to drink and gamble. The typical weekend there must have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's, you know, so to, that's an example. You don't have to be a gambler. You don't have to be a drinker to get that offer. You see the deliverables and you see where there's just value on top of value on top of value. And you say, well, how did he make money? The answer is in the casino. You know, he knew the lifetime value of his customers. And he knew if he could get somebody in the casino gambling, he was about to make a ton of money. Hey, Craig, it's more like the old, um, the uh, those timeshares, the real estate timeshares, where they'd say, well, we'll fly you out, you know, one week on us, all you can eat, all you can drink. But they'll, you'll have to watch like, these two videos on timeshares because they feel that they're, pitch is so compelling that you'll end up buying a timeshare. Yeah. And you know what? Boy, you, you just hit on something really key. There's another element. Yeah. So that's the hook. Come out. Hey, we'll give you a free vacation. All you have to do is listen to our silly sales pitch. Well, guess what they have you doing when you fly out there? So there is a financial commitment. You know, you 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 fly out, you're enjoying the, what we would call the after state after the purchase. You're in there, you're you're having this wonderful time at this resort or whatever it is, and it feels really good. The family's happy, you're happy. And all of a sudden, their their question is simply, hey, would you like this to be your vacation every year? If this feels good now, what do you think about doing it later? And kind of the same thing as Bob Stupak, they took money out of the lifetime value and moved it into customer acquisition. I have, I have, I have two time shares. <laughs> And I get offers from every casino. <laughs> I must be the right client. <laughs> I mean, 
yeah, th they work. They work. It's, um, and, yeah, and here's the thing that's really beautiful about this. You know, a lot of marketers, I'm sure you run these guys, they're, they're trying to scam people. They're, they're, they're looking for a trick or something like that to, um, to really fool people. And the thing about the timeshare offer, the thing about Bob Stupak's offer, they're open and honest. He's really clear. Hey, I want you to come here, drink, drink a lot, and then go in my casino. There's no secret there. Craig, we, believe me, we really appreciate the theory behind it, and it obviously resonates with us. But our audience are roll up your sleeves, wake up early, go to bed late, blue collar contractors, HVAC guys, small business owners of America. How can they apply that first time offer to them? Like, how can we structure a first time offer for a roofer, for a home improvement guy, for a trucker? Yep. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example for an HVAC guy. I'm going to give you an example for a roofer. So uh, when I moved, I live in Austin, Texas. Um, we get hail and heavy storms here. And I move into my house and we have a nasty storm, a little bit of hell. And I'm looking at the roof thinking, oh, I think there's a shingle mix missing. My neighbor comes up to me and says, oh, call this number for $75. They'll come out, they'll get on your roof and they'll replace up to six shingles. Like, really? So I call them, they come out, they replace six shingles. I pay them the 75 bucks. There's no way they made money on that job. Next storm comes through. Um, I see another missing shingle. Call them up, bring them out. They get on the roof, replace the shingle. Eventually, a storm comes that just destroyed the roof, destroyed both uh, both my cars. You know, um, you know, just big nasty hail. Guess who the first person I called was? The six shingle roofer. The six shingle roofer. I had I had their name and phone number in my list of contacts. Of you know, I have a list of. You need this in your ha in the house. If we need some, you know, some trade, I have a list of trades of people that I've worked with or have been referred to me. I they got the call straight away. So that's one example. But Craig, I love the way you phrased it because the way you put it makes total sense. Because Matt and I, we always come across this. Some of the most expensive portions of any business's business model is client acquisition. Yeah. Well, by by advancing that first time offer, all you're doing is taking a portion of that lifetime, hopefully recurring right now, and accelerating it to that client acquisition. So you're literally making lemonade out of lemons. Yep, absolutely. Um, so HVAC example, uh, there's a HVAC in Charlotte, North Carolina called Morris Jenkins. Uh, very big, anybody who lives in Charlotte knows who they are. Uh, by the way, they're also known to be the most expensive. They're in their customer reviews that people are saying, they're expensive, but I sure like them. And um, <laughs> they're doing something right. Yeah, yeah. Well, they ran a special. I don't know if they still are, uh, but they ran a special. Uh, and think about this. We're talking Charlotte, North Carolina. Summer's rolling around. It's humid there. It's nasty. If your HVAC isn't working, life is about to suck. If you have kids, they're going to annoy the crap out of you because they're, they're unhappy. And so they ran a campaign saying, hey, you know, you wouldn't bring it in uh, gentle. And they had, you know, they had a little song in my head, gentle, gentle. And what they were saying was, we're going to come out and we're going to check your uh, HVAC and condition it for spring and summer. So everything's running. We're going to make sure there's a full charge. We're going to uh, make sure everything in every way you're ready for a summer in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that will cost you $89. Now, I don't know what the rates are of your listeners, but I don't know. It's hard to get an HVAC guy to my house for $89. That's a classic loss leader. Yeah. And it's great. They come in, they spread goodwill. They, um, you know, we were talking in the green room about oxytocin, the bonding of, you know, the hormone that creates bonding. And they're in there stimulating that oxytocin in the homeowner saying, hey, I'm here, I'm making sure, I'm not only am I giving you a good deal, but I'm going to make sure your summer is without incident. All right, we're sold. First time off, it works. Yeah. So Craig, so, this, this didn't happen in a vacuum, right? Like you you had this epiphany at some point to leverage your life's calling into showing small business owners how to create these, these first time offers. Walk us through that um, tragic yet 
beautiful six missing weeks of your life. Well, so, so yeah, interesting story. So that was actually, um, we had the offers put together years ago, uh, but these six weeks of my life, um, when I woke up, I was in a coma, you know, so let's catch everybody up. I was in a coma uh, for six weeks and uh, they, for a month of that, they told my wife I was going to die. And, um, and when I woke up, um, my brain was scrambled. Um, and a weird thing had happened during those six weeks I was out. My trust in the doctors had plummeted. It fell through the floor. My trust in my wife went through the roof. And the doctors would come around. They, they'd want to do some procedure on me. And my brain was scrambled. All I knew was I didn't trust them. So I said, no. Whatever the doctors wanted me to do, my answer was no, because I didn't trust them. So they would go to my wife and they'd say, hey, can you talk to your husband about this? And she'd come up and she'd say, hey, the doctors want to do this thing. And I'd say, is it safe? She'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's safe. As soon as I heard her say it was safe, I dropped my guard and I was like, okay. And all that happened during those six weeks. And when I got out of the hospital, I started thinking about this. I was like, what happened? Uh, and actually, before I got out of the hospital, uh, as I was trying to piece back reality, I'd had a bunch of dreams in my coma, which were wild. Uh, but uh, I had, I believe those dreams were real. So one day, I, uh, when I started realizing everybody believes something else about reality than me, I was like, oh, crap, I'm screwed. And so I called my wife over to my bed and I said, I'm going to tell you some things. I need you to tell me if they, these things really happen. And so I started talking about being at some resort in Louisiana where they sprayed raw cow's milk at my face. Believed it. 100% believed it. And uh, she's like, yeah, that didn't happen. I was like, was that Matt's um, timeshare purchase? Uh, maybe so. Maybe so, because I also got overcharged there. Um, so, um, but anyway, I said, well, at one point you came in, you put your hand on my shoulder and you said, Craig, this is Karen. I'm your wife. It's going to be okay. And Karen sat back. She looked at me and she said, Craig, I said those exact words when you were in your coma. And as I started processing it, it hit me. I was like, well, you know what? This is like a Maya Angelou quote. People will forget what you said. They will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And when I was in my coma, the doctors were walking around me saying words of death and despair. But in contrast, my wife was speaking words of hope and life into me. And what that did was that radically changed the trust because of the feeling that they gave me, the feeling the doctors gave me destroyed trust. The uh, feeling my wife gave me accelerated, increased trust. And after I got out of the hospital, I kept thinking about that. I was like, this is fascinating. And then it hit me. That's what our first time offers do for people. We're giving them an experience that accelerates trust. And the, um, and the natural result is if you have a high ticket sale that you're trying to do, you can compress that sales cycle. You know, so if you're selling, uh, I mean, when I bought my, HVAC, uh, replaced it about 10 years ago. I spent 17,000. I imagine it's, geez, that's probably a 25 or $30,000 system. Now, well, if you're trying to get somebody to make a $30,000 purchase, they're scared. They're cautious. They don't know if they can trust you. And so do solve a small problem for them. And when you solve a small problem, it accelerates the trust building like you wouldn't believe. And charge them, by the way, charge them for it. Don't do it for free, but don't charge them a lot. Start, char and that's one of these things, you know, kind of like the football phone. They gave that away for free when you bought a subscription, you know, for us, first time offers like the roofer, 75 bucks. You know, it's not free. They didn't make money on it, but there was a chain, an exchange of money. Uh, like uh, Morris Jenkins in Charlotte, North Carolina, 89 bucks. We'll come out, make sure your system's ready for something. So, Craig, rumor has it you're now leveraging all this into a book. Talk us through the process of writing the book, and when can we expect it? Um, 
Yeah. So writing a book sucks. It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't suck. I, I, I enjoy it. It's wonderful. It's just finding the time and focus to sit down and write. But it's been really good. And, you know, and it's it's interesting when, um, so the, the short answer is I'm actually hoping to have the first draft done. I was originally targeting this week. Looks like it'll be next week. You know, to have the first draft done next week. Uh, then we have to go through, do a few rounds of editing, and then we have to send it to the editors. Uh, so it'll probably be coming out, um, you know, towards the end of the year. My goal would be to have it out by October. Uh, but, you know, one of the really cool things when you sit down and write a book, you, you, you have to organize your thoughts. And, you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. As I was, as I was writing, it hit me. I was like, you know what? There's a drug that will turn anybody into a master closer. And this drug... Uh, but it's not a drug you take. It's a drug you give to your customer. And when you give it to your customer, it immediately uh, creates trust. It reduces anxiety. And it uh, creates this incredible bonding, you know, like um, like the bonding between a mother and a baby, um, that type of bonding, and does it instantly. But here's the thing. It's ethical because you're not going to slip it in your their drink. You're actually going to boldly tell them about it and then they're going to pay you for it. Well, the drug is oxytocin, you know, and it's that hormone that's naturally released in the body when certain things happen. Like when a mother holds her baby for the first time, it causes surges of oxytocin in the baby, uh, surges of oxytocin in the mother, and it creates this incredible bonding. And where it came up in the book was as I was talking about this acceleration and trust in uh, the delivery of first-time offers, I realized when they're structured properly, you're stimulating an oxytocin release in your prospective customer. And when they have that, and you're trying to sell a 30,000 uh, HVAC, they're bound to you. They trust you. And remember I said, when they're thinking about that purchase, you have high anxiety, uh, you, you, you need to you low trust, and you're not sure if it's the right thing. Hit them with some oxytocin, and all of a sudden, they uh, it's making that sales a lot easier. Craig, you talk a good game, man. Why do we try to stimulate some oxytocin in our audience? I mean, have you got any offers for us? I do, I do. So, um, I you know, I'm, when I, where his mouth is, I love this. Um, yeah, you know, it's a little bit of history. When I made my first first time offer, it failed. My second one failed. My third one failed a little bit less. It took me 18 months to just start getting something working. And then we've been perfecting it over the last five years. Well, I put together a guide uh, to help you avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. And I also have a course, a self-paced course. So anybody that's listening to this podcast, if they go to alliesforme.com slash liquid lunch, they will get the guide and they'll get 23 days access to the course. Uh, the reason we limited 23 days, we're not trying to be chiselers. Um, we know that when people sign up for free courses, they never take them. We want you to take this. We want to change your life. And so we found that when we put a 23 day limit on it, we see it. We see it in the analytics. People come in, they start putting to work. It starts changing their life. That's awesome. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. So, so Craig, talk to me, tell me a little bit more about, how you, what type of companies you work with, right? Who's your client base generally? Some B2B, right? Higher offers, but what really consists of a higher ticket price? What, what would you say? Because I, I get different opinions from different people. You know, um, high ticket, I had someone ask me this. They said, what's high ticket? I say high ticket's always in the perception of the person writing the check. <laughs> uh, and let me give an example, you know, the, um, I'm in this mastermind group with a guy who said he had a $50 offer. I'm like, well, tell me about that. And turns out this $50 offer he's selling in South America. I said, well, what's the monthly, uh, what's the monthly salary of somebody down there? He said a thousand, two thousand dollars Like, so you're going after like 5% of their monthly income. He's like, yeah. I said, that's high ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where we see it, um, 
usually five, six, seven figures is what we would call high ticket. You know, the big thing is um, the the purchases that they really slow down have to think about uh, where they get really scared. You know, there's, um, it's funny, there were some studies done years ago showing that one of the biggest fears that people have is the fear of being taken advantage of. And even if you're selling something for a dollar, if they feel that they may get ripped off, they're more afraid of being made to look stupid than losing the dollar. And so, but that kicks in the hyperdrive when you're starting to talk about 10,000, 100,000 or a million dollar offer. And, and so people just slow down and think through these purchases a lot more because they don't want to make a mistake. And so that's really kind of, you know, in terms of high ticket, it's where do they slow down and seriously weigh, Hey, do I want to spend this money? Do I want to spend 30 grand on a new HVAC or do I want to go with this other one that's, you know, substantially cheaper? What's, what's the store for you now, Craig? You've, you've obviously had built a successful business. You've gone through some adversity. You're writing a book. What's in store for us in Craig's 3.0? Uh, 3.0. So actually, um, I'm releasing two books this year. One's more of a personal book about our, uh, my wife and my journey through, um, uh, so I was in the hospital three months, still recovering now two years later. Uh, and so it's, uh, that's, there's one book about that. That's, that's further along, actually said to the editors this morning. And, um, but the, uh, the big thing, you know, what I'm saying is 2023 sales have gotten a lot harder. And so we, we do broad marketing strategies for, uh, companies, um, and what we're doing in 2023 is we're focusing on these first-time offers, uh, helping people build them. They uh, they they're deceptive. They look simple when they, when you present them. You're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And what we found is uh, when it goes, even with our guide, we watch people systematically make mistakes that we warn them against. And um, and so we're helping uh, helping businesses build these offers and we can build one in one day of their time that that's usually pretty mind blowing one day wait how long did you just say it takes to build the offer did you say one day one day that's amazing yeah we do a little bit of work in advance but yeah we spend one day and and you know what here's what's really interesting this goes back Lou to your original question about the unspoken language of sales when we start this one day strategy we tell them your biggest hurdle defining a perfect offer is your insatiable desire to sell. And so I actually spend several hours getting people out of a mindset of selling and into a mindset of serving. And when we do there, all this, when we do that, all of a sudden some of the most amazing offers come out and I've never, never started a day knowing how it will end. And I'm always surprised by what comes together, but pleasantly surprised. Um, it, but it takes caring, getting people into a different mindset. And once, once we get them there, I mean, truly amazing offers. Craig, thank you so much for being here. We want to be respectful of your time. But before we let you run, I do have one last question for you. Yeah. We hear you're fine, Matthew. You lost you, buddy. Matthew's having technical difficulties. Do you know what he was going to ask me? Yeah, but it was too intimate. I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> All right, Craig, what, what's the best first time offer you've ever been part of? I tell you, though, the one that was most fun for me to design was uh, free money, uh, almost like Bob Stupak's offer. So this was a, uh, a commercial, a guy who did con commercial construction. His customers were actually investors. And so when we were working with him, I asked him, I said, well, what's the lifetime value of an investor? When you, know, when you bring a new investor into your world, what does that mean in terms of money in your pocket over time? And he sat down, did some calculations, and he said between four and five million. And I asked him, I said, well, if a new investor is worth four to five million dollars to you, how much would you be willing to spend to acquire a new investor? And he thought about it a little bit more and he said, I'd be willing to spend a million. You know, if you're telling me I, I give you a million and you get back four or five million, 20% client acquisition cost. Yeah. 
Uh, I said, well, we can drive a bus through that. That's, uh, that's pretty good. And, and we, we did, we, um, so we started looking at his project and, you know, all of our first time offers have a minimum of three, maximum of five deliverables, but the key one with his, so his customers were people that manage family offices. They were looking for new and different investment vehicles to make money for their, their client. Uh, but also they don't want to take risks. They don't necessarily, you know, think about the due diligence you're going to go through before you give somebody a, you know, uh, 5 million on a project or several, you know, even one or 2 million on a project, you know, you're going to go through all sorts of due diligence. And so I said, Hey, let's take one of your $40 million projects and let's carve out uh half million dollars of special shares. And you're going to use this half million dollars of special shares to bring on new investors. And you're going to divide them into five blocks. And here's, here's what you offer them. You tell them that, Hey, we're going to help you make a lot of money for your client, but you don't know us. We don't know you. We may not be a great fit. We have an offer to just kind of test out the relationship. If you buy $50,000 of shares in this project, we will immediately match it with another $50,000 of shares. So you can go back and tell your client that you immediately doubled their money. And there were other items in that. And yeah, you know, and he asked a question. A lot of people say it was like, well, who's going to be paying that $50,000? That's well, you have a marketing budget, right? I said, yeah. So you're just, that's just part of your marketing cost. But you told me earlier that a new investor was worth, you know, that you're willing to spend a million dollars to acquire a new investor. I'm just asking you to spend 50K. That's a good one. We love it. Yeah. Mike, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. We'll have you back when the book launches. And I'm going to tap into my inner Matthew. That's a wrap of another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Lunch Project.